What a fantastic view down into the terrain that we're going to be walking through today on a magical mystery lost river walk. I was going to ask you to guess which one, but it's probably going to be in the title of the video, so you'll know which one it's going to be. So today we're finally walking the Lost River Ephra, South London's Lost River. I would say South London's principal Lost River. Such a river of, of story. I mean, all rivers are rivers of stories, but when they become buried under the ground, their mythology takes on a kind of new potency. They seem to gain power the more we try to deny them. And I think the Ephra, along with the Fleet and with the Tyburn, are some of the most powerful of our lost rivers. They really do reverberate through the ground of our great city, which is probably, I wonder if that is why Ben Aranovich wrote his uh, Lost Rivers of London series. Fantastic books they are. I mean, you've got to, if you haven't read any of those yet, and you're here, you've come here watching this video, the deities of the rivers of London are real people living in London, mixed with a kind of police procedural kind of uh, format, structure. They're incredible books. I'm trying to remember who Ephra is in those books, actually. What Ephra, what Ephra looks like, what Ephra's personality is, because I guess that would be drawn from the personality of the river, and the river itself has a kind of coexistent relationship with the landscape around it, the landscape that it produces, that produces it. And actually, I don't know if you can tell already, I'm walking downhill, and we've got that view out there. And this is such an incredibly kind of hilly landscape it's incredible the Ephra actually has two sources one of them is in this park that's why we're wandering through this park and I'm talking to the camera like this and the other one is just a little bit further it's what they call it the upper and the lower this is the lower branch and the upper branch is just the other side of Crystal Palace and coming out of Crystal Palace station there's such a steep climb to get to here because you have to climb the ridge produced by those two branches of the river so you climb out over the ridge and drop down the other side to this park here. It's that straight away, if you had any doubts about the topography of South London and about the role that the river plays in the kind of creation of that topography, man, that hits you in the face as soon as you come out of Crystal Palace Station. So I'm really excited about this walk today. You can probably tell already the amount that I'm just, like, you could see, I, I, I don't know what the words are that I need, but I'm uh, brimming with excitement. I'm a little bit intimidated as well. I, I don't mind it being right. I'll be honest with you right up front. There's such a lot of material about the Ephra. It's a very well recorded and celebrated river. I have a whole book here, which is recommended to me by, by Liam, one of my wonderful supporters on Patreon. And uh, he sent me a, a wonderful set of notes actually for the Ephra. And it's a book by, by John Newman called uh, River Ephra. South London's secret spine. So I'll be taking the route uh, from this book. It's got a map in it. And also there's a few other sources online that I looked at with the route. And there's some plaques actually at uh, various points. I'm gonna try and find those plaques. I mean, I'm gonna to stick to John Newman's route. So if that takes me away from the plaques, uh, then so be it. I think this is my longest opening piece to camera I've ever done. And that tells you a lot about today's walk. So we're gonna, well, should we just, let's just crack on, let's find the source. It's in this park, basically. So this branch of the Ephra, I think, rises here somewhere at the, on the sun-kissed slopes of Westow Park on this high ridge. And you can see where this ridge descends into a river valley there. So this is classic kind of, you know, spring territory. And John Newsom talks about, sorry, John Newman, I should say, talks about this sort of hummocky, hillocky, bit of land here at the top of the park as being classic of the thing he calls a spring sapping where the spring kind of uh, affects the lie of the land. It's lovely to see these snowdrops here. So there's this wonderful map in, uh, in John Newman's book and it shows that we exit Westow Park and then we basically go along Chevening Road along the side of Upper Norwood Recreation Ground. So we're going to head this way. Chevening Road. It's, uh, it's kind of interesting that the river runs beneath the road here and actually not through the recreation ground because uh, that would be the, the standard practice for a lost river would be to 
the uh, where there's open space, that's where you'd find the river. But not in this case, apparently. It's sort of here, running underneath the road or behind these houses. So the, the Ephra was running above ground in quite a few places until around the 1830s, certainly the early 19th century, when it befell the fate of a lot of London's rivers and got absorbed into the sewage system. They just literally used the natural flow of the watercourses to push the sewage uh, towards the sewage treatment works, which I suppose makes sense, but it feels like a, one of the great travesties of London. One of the great crimes of engineering is also one of the great achievements of engineering. The creation of the sewage system was also a tragedy for its watercourses. And what I find really interesting, what John Newman says in his book, is that actually the name Ephra doesn't really come into usage until the mid-19th century. There were all these kind of colourful myths about its origins being Celtic or being Romano-Latin and all these other things. In reality, it becomes a sort of um, a back formation from the name of a farm. And there's a link to Heathrow. I'm not entirely sure. I did read that bit and didn't fully understand it, but it's, a name got borrowed from elsewhere in London. It got given to the name of a farm, Ephra Farm, the river ran through it and so they sort of just started using um, the name based on the name of that farm but before that it was known as different things along its courses we have seen that i think with other rivers in london it's not an uncommon thing to happen <laughs> recreation ground here, Upper Norwood Recreation Ground, is a survivor of Norwood Common. There's a lot of common land all around, well, all around London, but particularly South London, you know, and a lot of it still remains. I did a calculation when I was writing my, writing my book, This Other London. I can't get through a video without mentioning it, can I? But I think I've worked out the acreage that uh, was still existing in, in uh, South London. There's loads of it, you know, two in common, Streatham Common and a number of others all around South London. So these little survivors of the old landscape, the pre-industrial landscape, the pre-enclosure landscape as well. Oh, actually look, you can see where the river's running is a clear dip in the ground there, the river valley, the bottom of the river valley. So it was running behind the houses of Chevening Road. But then it, I think, according to John Newman's map, it runs through the grounds of uh, what was once a convent for I think it was then used as a, an orphanage or a, basically it was a place for uh, survivors of the Irish potato famine. Uh, but I don't know. Let's see. Let's have a look and see if we can follow it onwards along the road. No, I don't think we can get across the grounds of the school. It looks like there's various schools now on what was once, once the convent's grounds. Then that was Norwood Common as well. So I think we have to go up the road here and then around, which is kind of standard for a river walk. We expect to do that a bit. This is the, uh, the Victorian convent, I think. This is a really impressive church, the Church of the Faithful Virgin. Although we've got a map and about three different sets of directions, it's quite nice to do a little bit of your own river hunting, isn't it? Like, it's a little bit more exciting. I, think, <laughs> I don't need to be an expert river hunter here to see where the bottom of the river valley is and where it leaves the convent grounds to our left. And it cuts across a little bit of Norwood Park here. And then I think in the next set of streets, we might have our first Ephra plaque that we have to try and find. And I kind of, I kind of blew my bit about the old common lands of South London a bit early. It's Norwood Park, really, which is the remainder of the old uh, common land of this area. We've now crossed into Lambeth, by the way, and this is one of the highest points in the London Borough of Lambeth. Of course, the name Norwood, not particularly mystical, is a reminder of the great North Wood that was owned by the Archbishops of Canterbury. It's incredible to think of much of South London as being covered by this dense wood of pollarded oak. So we're going to go along Elder Road here, which isn't exactly on the course of the river. The river's slightly to our right, I think. I think it runs uh, beneath the, the football pitch here and behind those houses. But the next thing we want to find is the Ephra plaque. I think there's a stink pipe. It's on Gypsy Road. So that'll be exciting, won't it? 
This is an interesting building here on Elder Road. It's going to be one of those I'm going to have to look up after. I'm not going to speculate as to what I think it was. Okay, I think it was some sort of hospital. Really clear to see where the river's running. You see there at the bottom of the hill. There's a clear valley here, a real river valley. You'd know there's a river here even if you hadn't been sent this way looking for a river. Right, let's go down Gypsy Road and see if we can find our first Ephra plaque. I believe it's by a stink pipe. In fact, I can see the stink pipe from here. So here we have a rather majestic stink pipe. And these pipes you find along the courses of sewers and they were to release some of the gases from the sewer pipes. Of course, the river was being used as the sewer. And just in front of it, we have a really wonderful plaque here. What does it say? The hidden river Ephra is beneath your feet. Isn't it lovely? I think all of London's lost rivers should have plaques like this. So the river's flowing this way through these football pitches and behind these houses here next to the school. I think it's the Fulham Foundation, Fulham Kicks. So we're going to go up the hill here to the top and walk down Auckland Hill and pick it up at the bottom. And then we go through West Norwood Cemetery, one of the magnificent seven, the one I haven't been to yet. Now, more great views here. I think that must be the Crystal Palace radio mast, mustn't it? I mean, it should be pretty obvious, I would have thought. Go down Auckland Hill here to Norwood High Street. It's another great view here from Auckland Hill looking over the river valley. Absolutely fantastic. I mean, I've never been a South London person, as I think I've said before, but every time I do a South London walk, I really, I find it really revelatory, really inspiring. I sort of feel like I've overlooked South London unnecessarily for many years, over 30 years. And I, I, I get now, finally, after all this time, I get why some people really prefer living in South London to, to north of the river. It's got a very different feel to it. It's a lot more kind of benign and residential, isn't it? North of the river is where all the, all the, all the kind of commercial activity is all the industry and all that business. Whereas this feels kind of, I get it anyway, to, to my South London people out there who are diehard South Londoners, I, I finally understand what you've been going on about. I understand now, my apologies. This is another kind of classic Lost River landscape here with the railway bridge and the kind of scrap yards and industrial yards and units here. Pilgrim Hill, and you can see clearly where the river's running across the frame here, left to right across the frame here, at the end of East Place. And I think I read somewhere, it might have been on Diamond Geezer's blog, that East Place is a place which still floods. I think this low bit of land here is still prone to a bit of flooding. So after cutting through those scrap yards and the railway line, that I think the river cuts through here. Runs, there's a, a crescent here, Dunbar Street and Dunelm Crescent. I think it was called Elm Grove originally. And you can see this little bit of uh, parkland here, this is where the river ran through this little garden. And there's the wall, the brick wall of Norwood Cemetery, one of the magnificent seven. And that's where we're going next. The river cuts right through the cemetery. I love the Victorian iron railings you get around the cemeteries, the magnificent seven cemeteries. Look at that. Fantastic. And this is not great news at this point. It looks like the, this gate to West Norwood Cemetery is locked. It may be you have to access it from the other side, which wouldn't really fit in with the walk, I'm afraid, because we pick up just to the right, uh, well, to the left of the frame, but just right off the road here. So the river cuts across, directly across West Norwood Cemetery. And then the other side in Robson Road, we get another plaque, I believe. Wow, look at St Luke's Church there, silhouetted against the sky. That's a really magnificent building, isn't it? Norwood's a really interesting place, Norwood High Street. I think I'm going to come back, actually, and do a West Norwood and Crystal Palace video rather than just scoot through it on a river walk. Here we go. This gate to West Norwood Cemetery is open. We just pop our heads in, actually, because <laughs> this is right at the point where the river leaves the cemetery. So we'll just find that point if we can. 
Look at this. Isn't this sensational? I know some people say West Norwood is their favourite of the Magnificent Seven, so I can see why instantly. So West Norwood was opened in 1836. I don't know where that places it in the pantheon of the Magnificent Seven. And I've, uh, I'll link below to um, some other videos I've made in the Magnificent Seven cemeteries and also a series of audio guides I made actually to three of them so they've got more information. But they were built uh, in the 1830s, between the 1830s and 1840s to alleviate the pressure on parish churchyards which have become, you know, overfill due to the population expansion of London. So they built these cemeteries as a response. Should we do the list? So we'll do the list of the Magnificent Seven together. I'm probably going to forget one of them. So we'll do, we'll eat, well, West Norwood, that's the one that I used to forget. So we've got West Norwood, we've got Nunhead, made a video there recently. I'll link to that below, some of you will remember that. We, so we've got Nunhead and West Norwood. We've got Kensal Green, actually Old Soul Cemetery. We've got Abney Park, that's four. Highgate is five. Tower Hamlets is six. Ah, there's always one. Isn't there? There's always one that I can't remember. Brompton is seven. Brompton, we did it. I bet some of you did it quicker than me, didn't you? And you always get obelisks in the Magnificent Seven because, you know, the Victorians were really, in, you know, sort of, I would say, mm, obsessed with ancient Egypt, but also, of course, ancient Egypt is known for its veneration of the dead, you know, with its great monuments to the dead. So I think they were importing some of that tradition. And I just had a really interesting interaction with a very pleasant young man who just walked up to me, saw the camera, went, can I have a look at that photograph? That looks like a really nice photograph. And me, being someone who walks around London a lot, if someone comes up to you and says, can I have a look at your camera? You obviously say no. <laughs> I went, no, you can't. And then I think he was a little bit taken aback. I don't think he, I think he was possibly South African, I think. And uh, he was a bit, oh, it just looks like a nice photograph. Anyway, we got chatting. I thought I'd chat to him. I could see he was nice. And he, he comes running here and he says he finds it really peaceful and relaxing. He says the dead have a very calming presence to them. I thought it was really interesting. And these places are there. A lot of people love to walk in these um, Victorian cemeteries because they were built as cemetery parks. They were landscaped and laid out very carefully to be enjoyed as open spaces as much as places for burying the dead. Places to come for peaceful, quiet, calm reflection. Then a guy bowls through filming himself walking and you can see where the river's running through the grounds here just where that stone lodge is I'll put a little arrow in there or, or an X and it's running across here and then out into Robson Road which is where we will go next and hopefully see a plaque there so we've come out of the cemetery and turned right straight away into Robson Road and we're going to look for another plaque which I think is on the cemetery wall here. I can already see the river valley from here. It's really obvious isn't it? So here is the stink pipe attached to the cemetery wall in fact. But apparently there was a plaque on the cemetery wall and it's not, there's not one here so maybe it's further along but it should be here if this is the point where the river left the cemetery. I can't see a plaque here along the cemetery wall so I don't know. There's another stink pipe over there, so maybe that's where the plaque is. Nope, still no plaque. Oh well, not the end of the world, is it? So we're now in the road parallel to Robson Road, and look, you can really clearly see that we're looking down into a river valley there. You can see where the effort is slicing through the landscape beneath the streets. Then we're going to turn right here along Barston Road. This point here with the F for basically cutting behind lots of houses you have to take a really ridiculous zigzaggy route to keep getting views of the river. So what we're going to do actually is we're going to go down here and then head up to the other branch of the Ephra, the upper Norwood branch and then shortly after that the two, uh, the two rivers the two branches of the Ephra can join and head on through Brixton and that's the next section of the walk. I mean that's when I think in a lot of ways the Ephra walk really gets going as it punches its way through central Brixton and that's where we see lots of references to the river, to the Ephra, Ephra Road, uh, there's a number of others anyway. Um, that's the bit 
that I'm actually probably most excited about. And of course, I haven't talked about the, the great stories and the mythology connected to the Ephra yet. That's coming the next bit. That's partly because they relate to that part of the Ephra. That, that's the more, I don't know, is it the more storied part? I don't want to make such a bold statement when I know so little about the river. <laughs> Turning into Tollsmere Road here, you can really see, look, that we're dropping down into a river valley once more as the Ephra cuts across the bottom of this road. And there's that majestic house at the top there, which you can imagine once upon a time before these houses were built, that would have had a view across fields with the river running through it. So we're gonna head along Lancaster Avenue, and then the next road, I'm not sure what the name is there, up to Croxted Road, and then we turn for Brockwell Park and Brixton. This is looking down Downmore Road, just to the, to the right of Thurlow Park Road, which is the road I'm on now, that, which is the high ridge, but you can see, look, the river's running down there in the bottom of that valley. Love these guys, the old uh, parish boundary markers here. I think it's Camberwell. The um, CA is buried beneath the pavement, but you can see Camberwell Parish. And I think a number of parishes join at this point up here. I think we're coming into Dulwich now. So actually it's at this point here, the junction of Thurlow Park Road and Croxted Road, where the two branches of the Ephra meet, the upper and lower Norwood branches. So now we are joining uh, the single route, the single course of the Ephra as we go down Croxted Road to Brockwell Park. And now we're going to head towards Dulwich Village and Dulwich Park, more significantly Hearn Hill, hilly ground carved out by the Ephra. So we're just going to go along here, along Turney Road, and the river is going to be slicing across this road, cutting through Dulwich Cricket Ground. So the Ephra is cutting across here, across the sports ground here, Dulwich Sports Ground. You can see, look, the radio mast there, which is right near the start of our walk. The radio mast at Crystal Palace. You can see how distant it looks now. And then it cuts across Turney Road here and goes around, well, goes around the edge of the cricket ground on the other side there. We turn into Burbage Road now. Surely that must be the great Shakespearean actor, Burbage. Got to be. It's the kind of place he'd have lived. He must have an association with with Dulwich, otherwise they've nicked his name unnecessarily. Last time I walked down this road, Burbage Road, Dulwich, which is actually quite a fine road, isn't it? Look at these houses, quite impressive houses. It was for my book, This Other London, my God, I've mentioned it twice. It's, let's be honest, it's unavoidable, isn't it? And the reason I was coming down here was to visit uh, Herne Hill Velodrome for the Autumn Omnium. This was in 2012, the year of the London Olympics, and Herne Hill was in danger of closure, which would have been a real tragedy because it's a survivor of the 1948 London Olympics, the austerity games, and the seating here is still the original seating from the 48 Olympics. And it's where Bradley Wiggins started uh, cycling. So that was, I did the walk in the autumn, autumn omnium, after the Olympics. And I thought it would have been a real tragedy that, you know, Wiggins was the great hero of uh, the London Olympics. A great, well, the, you know, is he the greatest Olympian? Steve Redgrave, Bradley Wiggins, but you know, and he'd get made cycling into the new rock and roll. And yet the place where he learned to ride a bike and learned to race was in danger of closure. I thought it was a real travesty. So I wanted to come down here and see what could have been the last omnium here. Thankfully, it was saved. Common sense ruled the day. And look, I'm stood right outside it now. It's such, a, it's such an iconic London location, Hearn Hill Velodrome. That chapter's called Beyond the Velodrome. It's a good chapter title, isn't it? And what was really lovely, uh, I got talking to the lady who was making the tea for the racing, and she said uh, it was unfortunate I hadn't been there a couple of weeks previously because the the announcer who does the you know does the announcements on the race and so sort of saying so this person's in the lead now and this is this race and this is that race that guy had been the announcer at the 48 olympics and had been doing the announcements of the track ever since 1948 which is amazing and here under the railway bridge we do have ego look we have a nice mural here that's a quite a nice painting of richard burbage the great shakespearean actor he was an actor-manager in those days, weren't he? 
15, 68 to 16, 19, look at that. Famous for his Macbeth, I think. He's got to have featured in a black adder, surely. So Dulwich is famous for its college, Dulwich College, a famous private school. It's also famous for John Ruskin, the great art critic, and its picture gallery, the Dulwich Picture Gallery, which I think, I think, I'm gonna stick my neck out <laughs> and try and remember that bit of my, my book. I think it might be the first dedicated picture gallery in London, might be wrong. My favorite kind of Dulwich fact though is none of that kind of, oh, this rich and famous person <laughs> lived in Dulwich once upon a time. I know I do like a bit of that sometimes, but it's actually that, Dulwich is, they said it's surrounded by seven hills like Rome. They compared Dulwich to Rome, the seven hills of Rome and the seven hills of Dulwich. And we're on one of them now, created by the river valley. And we're about to drop off it down along the, the Ephra. And this is curious because this is one of the points where the Ephra went by a different name in the past, the Winterbourne stream and there is a road here called uh, or Winterbourne or Winterbrook and there is a road here called Winterbrook Road. I remembered that from doing the walk all those years ago so it'll be good to find that and then we drop down Brockwell Park, Brixton and then we're hammering on to Vauxhall, Kennington Vauxhall, Kennington where it started. And we turn now into uh, Half Moon Lane and the and the effort is running to our, just behind the houses to the left here, but it's more or less following the course of Half Moon Lane. And here we go, Winterbrook Road, which I think was one of the early names for this section of the Ephra. The Half Moon Tavern. Wow, this looks like a proper old Victorian railway tavern, doesn't it? good place to end a walk. You go in there in the afternoon, that's the end, particularly when there's Six Nations rugby on. Again, rather curiously, the Ephra doesn't run through Brockwell Park. It's interesting, isn't it? Instead, it runs along here, along Dulwich Road, along the edge of the park, but not through it. Brockwell Park with this wonderful Lido. So this is the way we go onwards to Brixton with lots of Ephra references. Just get a shot of Railton Road in here because it's kind of one of the iconic Brixton roads, right? One of the iconic Brixton streets, Railton Road. See, it's been zhuzhed up a bit. And isn't that a beautiful old station there, Hearn Hill Station? Isn't it great they've kept it? So this is one of the images in John Newman's book, and the, and the river is running through here, through this little alleyway, I think takes the course in that direction there, onwards towards Brixton. And Dulwich Road here is apparently once called Water Road. It's a bit of a giveaway really, isn't it? You don't have to read very deeply into that. There was a, a lovely moment back there where this lady came up to say hello to me. She said, oh, are you making one of your walks? Because what I'm saying hello to you on behalf of my partner here who's too shy to come up and speak to you. That was really lovely. Apparently she did say though she was forced to watch one of my videos, made to watch one of my videos, which I can only presume was some sort of cruel punishment for, I don't know, scratching one of these records maybe or something, but lovely to meet you. And uh, thanks for coming up to say hello. It's always, I always enjoy it. I always enjoy it. It's always lovely to meet people that watch the videos when I'm out walking, making a video. So look, this is great. Just a little plaque in the street here. In front of the little bit of open land in front of these tower blocks here. And look, you've got a thing saying London's stinky history. The Lost River Ephra still flows beneath the streets of Lambeth and Southwark as a public sewer. And here's a little bit of text about the Lost River Ethra about a stink pipe. Lofty green pike behind you is a Victorian stink pipe, a hollow pillar built to allow noxious and smelly gases to escape from underground sewers high into the air above us. So it talks about the Ephra and the legacy. It says, although the Ephra is now entombed beneath, below the streets, its influence on our environment lives on. And there's a little map showing the course of the Ephra. Isn't that great? <laughs> And if you had any doubts about the course of the river, here's another enormous stink pipe indicating 
Now the river is beneath our feet here. And there you go, our first Ephra street name there, Ephra Parade. Ephra Road is running parallel to the route we're walking, but I don't think we actually need to go down there. We might, we might do just to log it on the walk, but it's a little bit of a detour. And we go along here, along Dalberg Road, which is the course of the Ephra. Then there's a little bit of zigzagging to do. That could be our opportunity to go off to Ephra Road and pick the river up as it comes into Brixton Central. So it's behind these, uh, these Victorian houses here. Are they Victorian? They might be more modern than that, I'm not sure. But it's behind those houses there that was the old Ephra farm that gives the river its name. So it's a very uh, significant location on this walk. So the Ephra is kind of cutting across Mervyn Road here. And then we're going to turn into the street on the left. And I think we get another name reference up here. I think this is where the Ephra Tavern is, actually on the Ephra. I nearly missed it. But I think this is thanks to Diamond Geezer's blog where he walked along the plaques. I think he did the Ephra walk, but he kind of took in all the plaques. It's a lovely old uh, vintage post box here and next to it you have an Ephra plaque on the ground. This is a great little corner and this is the corner of Rattray Road or Rattray Road and uh, Mervyn Road. Here's the pub. We call it Ephra Hall but on my phone it's called the Ephra Tavern. Anyway, wouldn't really matter, it's the Ephra bit that we're interested in isn't it? It's that right on the Ephra, right above the Lost River. So I think the Ephra is running right beneath those houses there, which is a little bit unusual because you normally find a gap between buildings where there's a river beneath the ground. So we can't follow it straight ahead. So what we'll do is we'll turn a left down there towards uh, Ephra Road as it becomes I think, Brixton Hill and we'll follow that into Brixton and pick it up on the other side there. Here we are in central Brixton. Brixton's one of the great suburbs of London, one of the greatest by without any question of a doubt. It's got its own personality, its own energy. It's fantastic stories. I do kind of love Brixton. I've got some heritage with it. It's a brilliant place, Brixton. The iconic Brixton Ritzy. It's lovely to see that they're showing uh, Baz Luhrmann's Romeo and Juliet. So here's a little bit of trivia for you. When my wife was an actor, she was shortlisted for the role of Juliet in that movie. And then they gave it to uh, Claire Danes. That was right when we met, actually, just when we met. Now we go along the iconic Cold Harbour Lane, the great Cold Harbour Lane, one of the great streets of Brixton, one of the great streets of London. And I wonder, Cold Harbour Lane, was that done? This is one of the great myths of the effort that we'll talk about soon, about how navigable it was. Could it ever have taken boats? It seemed to be unlikely. Not a hundred percent sure of the course here, but I'm going to go down Electric Lane because A, it's a great street, and B, looks it's a likely candidate, isn't it? It's a likely candidate. So I used to run poetry events at um, Brixton Art Gallery over there in Brixton Station Road. So I'd be down here all day on a Saturday. I'd be here running the gallery on a Saturday, and there'd be a lot of poetry workshops, and then we'd have the events in the evening. They were amazing events with fantastic people there, a lot of performance poets. And one of the guys who used to come and read down there was a brilliant author called uh, Alex Wheatle, who wrote a fantastic book called East of Acre Lane, which is one of the great, it's one of the great British novels of the 20th century, but it's certainly one of the great London novels. You must read it if you haven't done. He also wrote a fantastic book called uh, Brixton Rock about sound systems. A lot of music here, I might have to avoid it. Look, here we have one of the amazing Brixton arcades. This is Reliance Arcade. Market Row and these arcades are one of the great features of Brixton. It really is incredible to think that these arcades have been under threat at various times, actually quite recently, to be demolished and replaced with uh, shopping malls. Electric Avenue, the great Electric Avenue. <laughs> We're 
now on Brixton Road by Brixton Station. I think the river's cutting through here basically and it joins Brixton Road, at which point it runs right along Brixton Road all the way to Kennington. So it becomes very straightforward from here on in. So it's here in Brixton that we encounter one of its great myths. The Queen Elizabeth I used to sail up the Ephra in her royal barge to visit Sir Walter Raleigh at his house on Brixton Hill. And that, that story was repeated a number of times throughout the centuries. But John Newman says it would have been incredibly difficult to sail any kind of barge from the Thames up the Ephra to Brixton Hill. Even so, it's a great story and I bet it still gets retold to this very day as if it were true. There's the iconic Brixton Academy venue over there. So this point here, this little square in front of Brixton Police Station is the point where the Ephra joins Brixton Road and then it just flows straight along Brixton Road. And I think there are some Ephra plaques on this square here that we need to find. I think I can see them. Can you see them? You see there's a line of them here. Running across this square, marking the course of the river. And then that's where the river continues on there and runs right down Brixton Road. So there's no more uh, bending and turning for a, quite a distance actually now. So although Queen Elizabeth I almost certainly didn't sail up Brixton Road here in a royal barge, John Newman does say it is possible, it is likely that spawning salmon did leap their way along the Ephra to spawning grounds near its source, which is a really wonderful idea, isn't it? And he also talks about a giant eel that was caught, I think it was back there in Dulwich in a pond that was um, three foot nine in, uh, inches long and I think 11 inches in diameter, which is, that's a fair old sized eel. I wouldn't want to find that if I was going for a paddle, would you? And so it's possible that also eels um, used to come and swim up, up the Thames and then follow the effort. This is pre-industrial, of course, because once the industry moved into the area, the waters became polluted and then the, the effort becomes a sewer. So we're just going to plough on down Brixton Road here to the Oval and then we turn for the Thames, for the confluence with the Thames. I love this little red hut here. This looks like a survivor of another time, a different era altogether. One of the other Ephra myths that John Newman debunks, I'll tell you now, is that King Canute sailed his ships along the Ephra when he invaded London in 1016 with his Viking fleet. Um, Newman says it would have been impossible to have <laughs> sailed his boats up the Ephra and also it's going the wrong way. I mean, let's be honest, in the Chronicles, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle records how Canute sailed up as far as Greenwich and then of course he had to contend with the heavily defended London Bridge so he decided that he would bypass it. Apparently the Vikings were known for this thing of taking their ships over land. So what he did is he built uh, a ditch, he dug a ditch. It must have taken bloody ages though. That's the thing about this story I don't really get. Whilst he was digging his ditch why didn't they attack him? Anyway they didn't. And he dug a ditch through what is today Southwark. Southwark and some people say that's the origin of the name of Southwark. South Work, the South Work that uh, Canute used to get his ships around London Bridge back into the Thames and London eventually surrendered to Canute and he became the King of England. So we're coming up to Kennington here, that's Kennington Park down there and I always thought the effort flowed through Kennington Park. There is a plaque, I'm pretty sure there's a plaque in there but anyway uh, according to John Newman's map we go left here behind the church, quite a majestic church. I think he says that the Ephra was diverted here, the natural course of the Ephra was diverted here, and it may have flowed in and joined the uh, Earl Sluice, or certainly joined the Thames actually in Bermondsey rather than down in Vauxhall, which is where we're going now. I made a video walking around uh, Kennington with my mate Keaton <laughs> a few years ago, and I will link to that below. As well, there will be all sorts of information in the links below. Um, but we're getting close to the end of the walk now. 
just down here at Vauxhall. We're going to go around the back of the oval and then we get to the river, to the confluence. Exciting, always an exciting moment. I think we may still have some light left when we get there. This has been a bit of an epic, hasn't it? <laughs> Apparently around here somewhere was the site of the, uh, of the Kennington Gallows, where some quite grisly discoveries were made of skulls with chains screwed into them. It's all quite grim, isn't it? We're going to cross Clapham Road here and head for the river. So after flowing under the road, it actually passes over the top of the Northern Line, which is astonishing, isn't it? We travel through Oval on the Northern Line, just think there's a river going over the top of your head. These are interesting old sort of industrial buildings here. Just from the back, just parallel to Clapham Road. And this is Clayland's place. Never seen this before. The river is to our right, I believe, but I think we're soon to join it at the end of this street. And we're heading right towards those looming towers there at Nine Elms on the banks of the River Thames. Wow, it's quite an ominous end to the walk when you think about what it was like when we, when we started back in Crystal Palace. And at this stage, the river is flowing beneath the ground here in Clayland's Place. So we're just skirting around the side of the great oval cricket ground home of Surrey County Cricket Club, where England played test matches. Iconic venue. This wasn't my intended route, but we're going to go along Vauxhall Grove here into Bonnington Square, which I think has a good story. I'm trying to remember what it is. And you can see how close we are to the towers here on the riverside. Could Canute have imagined such things? Now, Bonnington Square here, I remember reading something about it a few years ago. I think it had a lot of um, squats here originally, and I think it became a community-owned, uh, a number of community-owned residences anyway, or certainly large amounts of kind of communal housing it was owned communally or cooperatively. I'm not, not sure if that is still the case, but it's quite a remarkable little pocket in any case. It's really beautiful. I think, is that a stink pipe? I think we have a stink pipe there, indicating the location of the river. Fantastic. So the diverted Ephra ran, I think, along here, along Lawn Lane, along the edge of Vauxhall Park. Of course, Vauxhall Park is uh, one of the key locations in Patrick Keeley's iconic seminal film, London, which I made a video following one of the walks from that film that started here at Vauxhall Park. It's also associations with uh, Conan Doyle and Sherlock Holmes, I believe, as well, as mentioned in Patrick Keeler's film. This is a great little park here, though. So we now have to negotiate this, uh, this gnarly list of crossings here, and I think go underneath the railway bridge near that uh, advertising billboard you can see over there, and then we should be on to the Thames. So I think the confluence of the Effa and the Thames is right there, sort of between those two towers, St George Wharf Towers. I think that's where we're going, just to the west of MI6, the least discreet intelligence headquarters, I imagine, I would say in the world, I think the CIA one's pretty well marked, isn't it? And if you haven't been down this way for a while, this is what you're missing. And these towers are gonna to stretch all the way along the Thames, along Nine Elms, through Battersea, and who knows where they'll stop. So at this stage here, the Ephra was the Vauxhall Creek. Something you see, isn't it, a lot where um, rivers make their confluence with the, with the Mother River. Like we have, uh, the, have the Barking Creek for the roading, the Deptford Creek for the Ravensbourne, and here it's the Vauxhall Creek. I can't look at that tower that, up there without thinking about the, uh, the helicopter that crashed into the crane that was on top of there. I think that happened about uh, 10, 11 years ago. And the helicopter crashed the pavement. Astonishingly, I think like two people were killed, which is tragic in its own right, but it could have been an awful lot worse. St George Wharf is a really exclusive development, real private development. I think uh, a number of oligarchs and various kind of shady figures live in there. So it's somewhere down there that the Ephra makes its confluence with the Thames. I can't actually see an outflow, can you? I'll have to go and have a better look, because I suppose the Thames is at low tide here. 
And this is the point, the sacred spot. And I believe it's around here somewhere, around this confluence that um, they discovered a, a Bronze Age bridge, like a causeway that went out across the Thames, demonstrating both that there was very early settlement in London along the Thames and that this was an important point in that, in that uh, stretch of the river. Although I guess the, the original course of the, of the Afro was actually to the east of here. It's really clutching at straws, but I can see a little um, metal flap. It seems to be like a metal door there in that uh, alcove, that brick alcove beneath St George's Wharf. That, that could be it, I don't know though. Well, I think stood here on St George's Wharf Pier it's a great place to sign off. Well, there we, I can't go any further. We've reached the end. We've reached, we've reached the real river. After this, we're swimming. Uh, sadly, I'm not a, a river god and I don't intend to test the theory that I just haven't discovered it yet. Thank you for coming with me on that amazing walk. It was a bit of an epic, wasn't it? I set off from Leightonstone before 10 a.m. this morning and it's now about half five, sunset. But that's, that's a cracking walk. That's, I don't like to rank my Lost River walks. But that's, that's a really good one. It's a really good one. I, no, I'm not going to even attempt to rank it. I hope you enjoyed it too. Um, you know, I, I don't... I'm, I, I'm so excited by that walk and so sort of slightly frazzled and, and I don't know, beguiled and by the river gods, obviously. Maybe they've done their... What does he call it? The glamour, I think, is what Urban Aranovich calls the magic the river gods cast upon mere mortals such as me. Um, I've sort of lost my train of thought. So I just want to sign off and say thank you very much. And as I always like to say, actually, I look forward to seeing you on the next walk, wherever that may be. I've no idea, literally no idea. I knew this one was coming, but the others, I'm not so sure now.